Let us uh, join together in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in 1837, a watch shop opened in Harlem, Netherlands, where a man named Willem ten Boom operated the business and also lived with his family in the second floor of the shop. Uh, you might already know this story, as I mentioned the word ten Boom. Um, but uh, I'm sure that Willem could never have imagined that decades later, this same building would become a refuge and hideout during an incredibly dark time. When Germany invaded the Netherlands during World War II, Willem's son, Casper, along with his wife, Cornelia, their four children, and three of Cornelia's sisters were all living in the crowded space above the shop. So it's a lot of people in one little small space. And uh, despite the, the tight quarters that they were already cramped, they began to hide their Jewish neighbors from the occupy, occupying Nazi regime in their home and were able to save an estimated 800 lives. The, uh, the, families, the family was eventually caught and imprisoned. Uh, and later, two of Casper's daughters, Corey and Betsy, were sent to a concentration camp called Ravensbrück. Corey survived the camp and went on to tell her family's story. Her name is Corey Ten Boom. She wrote The Hiding Place. And she fam famously said, Never be afraid to trust an unknown God, an unknown future to a known God. You know, for a lot of us, uh, that level of faith might feel beyond us. It might seem almost impossible to reach. Uh, it could seem like sort of a Herculean kind of faith that maybe someone else has, but not me. And yet, as we learned uh, last week through Tracy Mogg's testimony, uh, it's never a good idea to compare your circumstances with someone else's journey or to try to measure up to someone else's faith. As we will see today in the story from the Gospel of Matthew, God simply invites us to trust him. Wherever we might be, whatever doubts or missteps we might find ourselves in, and to inhabit that space with God by the grace of God. Nothing more, nothing less. God will lead us into his good will, and he will make a way. In today's scripture reading from Matthew 21, Jesus enters the temple in Jerusalem in the final stretch of his ministry, plots against Jesus' life have already been set in motion by the religious authorities, and it is mere days before the conflict that will escalate, that will lead to Jesus' eventual crucifixion. As Jesus enters the temple, he is immediately confronted by a group of chief priests and elders. And so in verses 23 and 24, it reads, when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Sounds like one of those Riddler type characters that you meet in a fictional novel. And, uh, but... Jesus, as we will see, is very perceptive to what's happening. When the chief priests and the elders ask about these things, these things that Jesus has been doing, the activities that are in question are indeed eyebrow-raising. Jesus has been challenging the Pharisees' expertise on the law of Moses. Who does that? He's been, he has been seen riding into Jerusalem and being greeted by the people as a returning king might be greeted, and then going straight into the temple to tip over the tables and the, of those money changers and lecture them about what is supposed to happen in the house of God's worship. 
And so Jesus is making waves people have noticed, particularly the religious authorities. All of, all of us, I think, if you can think about it for just a moment, I think you know what it feels like to be held in question by another person. Uh, we've all held some types of authority roles. Maybe you're a parent or a teacher. Uh, maybe you are a coach or a boss or a mentor. Maybe an older sibling, which is another name for a boss. <laughs> Maybe you're a club president, a pet owner, a volunteer leader, assistant to the assistant regional manager. The list goes on. Whether it is your judgment that's in question, your authority, your character, or something else, we've all been under that microscope at one point or another, right? My son, Julian, he's two and a half years old. You saw him in the children's time. He's getting very comfortable with the word no, which makes me uncomfortable because I hear it a lot. Um, but I, as a parent, you know, I'm in that space between allowing room for him to make his own decisions and also looking out for his health and well-being, because that's what parents do, right? Uh, as a parent that deeply cares about him, I feel like I have a fairly good idea of what's best for him. So when I ask for his obedience, it's for his benefit, or at least that's my intention, but when it comes down to things that he can't understand yet, like having to hold my hand in the parking lot, which he hates and breaks free every single time and sends me chasing, or uh, you know, simply you know, wondering why he needs to eat something other than dino nuggets, because can't we just have that for every meal? I'm simply having to ask Julian to trust me. But of course, I know the objections will come. And in here in Matthew 21, even Jesus is no exception to being questioned. As someone who has shown us what God-given authority looks like, Jesus is now prepared to take on those questions that often come to people in a position of power or influence. Interestingly, though, as we see in our story, Jesus doesn't answer the questions in a straightforward way. He doesn't give them that direct answer that they're looking for. Jesus knows that the question is rigged. It's, been, it's a ploy that is designed to trip him up and undercut his authority. And so we move on into verses 24 through 27. Jesus says, Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, Well, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, when, Why then did you not believe him? But... If we say John uh, of, uh, but if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, "We do not know." And he said to them, "Well, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things." The religious authorities that have come to Jesus here at the temple have come to frame Jesus. They are important members of the Sanhedrin, along with the Sadducees. They are the people that help make the rules. And as Alan Culpepper writes, the confrontation regarding Jesus' authority portrays the clash of authorities at the center of authority in Israel, the temple. See, the chief priests bring with them the elders who represent the influential families of Jerusalem, the Jewish aristocracy, the people that have, can, uh, that have weight behind their words, that got influence in the community. And this sparring that happens between Jesus and their powerful people in the temple eventually reveals how extraordinarily different their missions are. Jesus is on a mission to do the will of God and has been at work in public to make God's will will known to all. However, these authorities that confront Jesus have different plans. They are on a concealed mission to discredit Jesus because he has become a threat to their places of power. John the Baptist, the prophet whose job was to point people to Jesus, has already called them out and challenged them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. And now Jesus turns the tables on his accusers and ask about John's authority to baptize, to expose 
their hidden motives. If they say that John's ministry is God-given, then they will have to give an explanation for failing to listen to John. And if they reject John, then they will lose favor with the general public that seems to support him. And that final bit, losing favor, is the key. As Lisa Lamb writes, Jesus' query entraps them, or better said, exposes the trapped narrow space they occupy as they live in fear of the crowds. Like the elected officials ever checking their approval ratings, the religious leaders huddle to calculate their opinions and downsides and find that they are unable to answer at all. So as listeners of this story, I think it's wise to take just a moment to pause and remind ourselves not to vilify the religious authorities as if they're completely and totally different from us, right? Uh, we have, everyone has their own warts. And at our weekly staff meeting, as we were reading over this passage, Don asked the question, well, how often do we question Jesus, right? You know, like those times when we feel Jesus gently tugging on your heart to, to guide you closer to the will of God, and you're just like, oh, Respectfully, no, sorry, I don't think I'll be doing that, but thank you anyway, Jesus. See, we've all been in that position, and who are we to judge? The problem that Jesus confronts with the religious authority is, isn't that they are lawless, godless people. The problem is that they too often use their power and influence in a self-serving way rather than following Jesus' lead in empowering and healing people, especially those who are powerless. The authorities' fear of losing control blinds them to the greater will of God. Emmanuel Lardy writes this, The Akan people of West Africa have an ancient saying, Power is like an egg. When held too tightly, it may break. Or it falls and breaks when held loosely. Akan leaders were by this emblem constantly reminded of the sensitive nature of their office and the care that the responsibilities of leadership required of them. Earlier this week, I was asked uh, to write a letter for a former youth of mine named Jack. Uh, back when I was a youth director at Westlake Village, uh, his name is Jack, and he's now a senior in high school, which is blowing my mind. Uh, and he's about to head on to a senior retreat called Kairos. It's focused on faith formation, recognizing God's work in their lives, especially in the, those students' relationships with family and friends and classmates. And so part of this experience, this retreat, is receiving letters from their parents and other family members and others who have been important to them, letters that affirm them and encourage them and challenge them, and I thought, what an awesome idea. Like, how often do you get a letter from someone that's just saying, hey, you know what? I saw this in you and that in you, and you know what? This is what you meant to me. And so I loved sitting down to write this letter to Jack because it reminded me of the powerful thing that happens when we affirm the work of God happening in another person's life and encourage them to keep walking with God. In the letter, I told Jack how I had seen God's love in the way that he listened to others with genuine care, how his leadership in the confirmation class that we led back then inspired the other students to be invested and fully present, and how I knew that he was already on the path of trusting God with that unknown future. Learning to follow and trust God into that unknown future does not mean that we will always be able to discern God's will clearly and perfectly, right? Nor does it mean that we will get things right 100% of the time. In fact, we almost certainly will not. But it does mean that we can finally stop trying to micromanage our own lives with absolute control and instead trust that God is able to take our complex and sometimes messy lives and work through them to bring about his good and perfect will. will. Author Barbara Brown Taylor 
writes in her book, An Altar in the World, that God had been at work in every job that she'd worked, in every hat that she'd worn, to find a way to breathe meaning into her life as she reflected in all the different, you know, side jobs and uh, full-time jobs and, and even volunteer opportunities. She could see God using them to bring meaning into her life. Each one invited her into a new community of people, challenged her to learn new skills that she didn't even know she had, and opened a new window out of which to view the world anew. And so in this book, uh, she writes this. Earlier in my life, I thought that there was one particular thing that I was supposed to do with my life. I thought that God had a purpose for me, and my main job was to discover what it was. This thought heated up while I was in seminary, where I attended classes and drank with other students who knew exactly what they would do when they graduated. Upon request, most of them could deliver articulate accounts of uh, their calls to ministry. They took courses designed to prepare, their, prepare them to preach and teach and deliver pastoral care. They had long lists of people willing to write recommendations for them when it came time for them to apply for their first job in parish ministry. All I had was a love of what I was learning and the people that I was learning with. I loved the way the maple outside the dining hall turned fire engine red in the fall. I loved learning biblical Hebrew. I loved a young man named uh, uh, from Camden, New Jersey. I loved the professor who got so excited about what he was teaching that he fell straight backward from his chair. I loved going to daily chapel and sitting uh, and sipping coffee afterward in a common room furnished with fragrant old leather sofas and oil portraits of the school's luminaries. I loved looking around that crowded common room, wondering who would be the next luminaries, still so well disguised as students like me. I did not have a single clue what I would do when I graduated. I didn't even belong to a church, and so I began asking God to tell me what I was supposed to do. What was my designed purpose on this earth? How could I discover the vocation that had my name on it? Then one night, when my whole heart was open to hearing from God what I was supposed to do with my life, God said, anything that pleases you. What? I said, resorting to words again, what kind of answer is that? Do anything that pleases, do anything that pleases you, the voice in my head said again, and belong to me. At one level, the answer was no help at all. The ball was still back in my court, uh, where I got it left with all kinds of room to lob it wherever I wanted. I could be a priest or a circus worker. God really did not care. At another level, I was so relieved that I slutted down the stairs that night. Whatever I decided to do for a living, it was not what I did, but how I did it that mattered. God had suggested an overall purpose, but what was not going to, he was not going to supply the particulars for me. If I wanted a life of meaning, then I was going to have to apply the purpose for myself. Now hear me out. I do not think that Barbara Brown Taylor is saying that God could care less about what you do and is just too busy with other bigger, grander things. In fact, quite the opposite. I hear her saying that God's mysterious will invites us to step out in faith and live to pay attention to how God has already been at work in your life and then run with it. In a way, that, in a way this is Jesus' medicine for a group of leaders whose judgment and understanding of what God wants has been weakened and skewed by their unwillingness to follow through on God's wisdom that they themselves have been teaching. Hence, a couple chapters later in, in Matthew 23, we will hear Jesus say to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. 
But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. And they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. You know, Jesus' um, only response uh, when the chief priests and elders ask him about his authority is to answer their question with a question, and then he follows it up with a parable. And so verses 28 through 32, it goes like this. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. See, Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Cynthia Jarvis suggests that the best way to hear Jesus' parable is to understand the context of honor and shame in Jesus' society. Rather than thinking about which of the father's children was right and which was wrong, or rather thinking which was guilty and which was innocent, she makes the point that Jesus' listeners would primarily have been thinking about which was honorable and which was dishonorable in their treatment of their father. And so she writes this, Now what do you think of these two sons if the paradigm through which you do your thinking is ordered not by right or wrong or guilt or innocence, but rather by honor and shame. The son who obeys his father to his face is the righteous one. The son who kept his place, the son who has maintained the relationship, the son who has not shamed his father. Then comes a surprising turn in this parable. Jesus does not ask which of the two sons showed honor to the father, but instead Which of the two did the will of the Father? His question shifts the paradigm from shame and honor to obedience. Jesus spells out the metaphor, the place of honor on the way into the kingdom of God will be given to those who presently occupy places of shame, but who who do God's will, while the religiously righteous will bring up the rear. See, in a world where honor and shame is a major motivator, uh, which the religious authorities have come to tilt towards their advantage, Jesus tells us a story with a seemingly obvious response, but then changes the angle by asking an unexpected question. It isn't, which of the two was the most honorable? It is, which of the two did the will of the Father? For Jesus, who is obedient and is carrying out of God's will, soon even to the point of death, The main matter is about trusting God with our lives and believing that God's grace will shape that living. It isn't about winning God's affections through our righteous living. It's not about earning a a place of honor in God's court through saving face and making the right connections. It is about choosing to trust in Jesus, even when there are many unknowns on the road ahead. As Robert Farrer Capon writes, Jesus does not reach out to convince us. He simply stands there in all the attracting slash repelling fullness of his authority and dares us to believe. That is Jesus. Sometimes hard to understand and we feel repelled to what he's saying. Jesus, what do you mean? Other times we feel so connected to what he's saying. Yes, Jesus. But this is the Jesus who calls us to follow him because he's been given authority by God and invites us into that relationship even when we don't always understand what we're getting ourselves into. I think it's interesting that we never hear how the father in Jesus' parable react to the actions of the children, right? The only thing that we get from the father is the request to go into the vineyard and work. That's what the father wants, 
It's no competition. It's no test. It's merely a request to get a little dirt under their nails, make sure that the vines are healthy and able to produce fruit. Sally Brown writes, Whether resistant or eager, devoted or distracted, we can take heart. Both children are the fathers. Both are summoned. Both are sent. The fact is, we do not really know how it ends for either of them. Jesus does not say. Now, it is our story. It is open-ended. I love that. That invitation to put ourselves into that story, to wonder what child we will be, to wonder how we will respond to God when he asks us to go into the world, into the vineyard, to bear fruit. This is where the story begins with us. It continues on in our lives. You've heard the phrase, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. But perhaps today we say, where there is God's will, God will make a way. You know, I believe that as we hear Jesus telling us about not necessarily being perfect or not necessarily being uh, immediately responsive, but trusting God through the, the thick of the complexity of our lives and knowing that God will lead us into the way that is good, we can trust that God will show us what it is that we are supposed to do. And so I'm thinking if, for, if you are one of those people where you are constantly dogging on yourself and you are always having the hardest time, having the, a, a good self-image, you're the person that's your own worst critic and you're always cowering in fear of how God sees you because that's the image that you project onto God. I think that Jesus gives us a new picture in this story picture of God who lovingly extends a hand and says, come, work with me in the vineyard. Come, know that you are mine. I will show you what my good will is. Or perhaps maybe you're in a season in your life where you have hit a sort of a dead spot, so to speak. You're not really sure exactly where you're at or where God's taking you or what the next step is. Perhaps this is what you need this morning to begin praying and seeking God for that inspiration to wonder where it is that God is going to be sending you into that vineyard. And who knows what an impact that you will have when you go tend to those vines and people enjoy the fruit of your labors, the fruit of your love and your kindness and your compassion and your healing words. Who knows what lives you will change when you respond to that call? My prayer as we wrap up this service and move into our final song is that we will be able to listen and trust and obey. And that is our final song for this morning. So would you stand as you're able?